J'ai le plaisir d'accueillir euh, comme euh, président de séance euh, DBS Norris. DBS Norris est, est professeur euh, euh, Université de Delaware, Winter Tour, et elle est aussi responsable des programmes de conservation. Donc, Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Can you all hear me? And everybody's okay with your headsets? Yeah. Wow, it's bright here. <laughs> um, but anyway, I am. I'm delighted to uh, moderate this session. I think you're in for three interesting um, talks that are going to take some of the topics that we've addressed in slightly different directions. Before we start, before I summarize um, some of the presentations, I just want to say uh, again thanks to everyone who's organized this meeting. It's really been terrific and I think inspiring for all of us. Special thanks to Bertrand for his hard work and his dedication, his commitment to this field and um, to the advancement globally of the work that we do. But I think what has impressed me most is uh, the number of students who are here. And I'm not sure if they're all here yet, but I can see many of them are. And it's really fantastic. And I thought I would ask all the students to stand, all those who are earning master's degrees, undergraduates, PhDs, and conservation and related areas. OK, you guys. Um, and the reason is, and it, students, students, all of you, I know, I can see you all, you're all here, yeah. It's, it's really great that you guys are here um, because you're the ones, okay, you can sit down. <laughs> um, but you're the ones who will take this information and make a difference in this world. And um, I know you've been inspired by these talks and I would just urge each of you to take advantage of today, every minute of today, and connect with everyone you can who's here. Because we're all here and ready to help you make connections, increase your network, create opportunities for internships and postgraduate study. So please um, introduce yourself, make it a mission. Don't leave without having met 10 new people. Um, from around the world because it's a great opportunity for us to meet all of you and for you all also um, to connect with all of us. So anyway, I was totally impressed and inspired by the number of students who are here. Um, so now uh, for the start of the morning session for our third and final day of this wonderful conference. Um, as we address the political realities of preservation and we work to develop and advance new sustainable and effective practices worldwide, we must, of course, also always study the past, look back upon heritage conservation studies, and broaden our reach, our understanding, and our scholarly focus. And this will be sort of the uh, areas that our next three speakers will be addressing. And of course, we must always do so in collaboration. This morning we'll examine how scientific research on the consequences of environmental condition was applied to museum management and design in the 1930s, and of course what we can learn from that today. Subsequently, we'll consider and review the essential need to integrate environmental control systems and strategies to historic structures. And of course this is that constant challenge that we face in the preservation of collections and historic buildings and reconciling uh, the differences and the needs. And in this case, we will especially hear about the preservation of churches, which hold such stunning collections, decorations, wall paintings, polychrome, etc. And they're often, of course, in competition with the rising needs for thermal comfort for the parishioners and for the many tourists who have the pleasure to visit these wonderful sites. Our final presentation prior to the coffee break will summarize um, the impressive and lifelong scientific research on the conservation and preservation of leather, a material that's used in all civilizations as part of daily life and now found in our museums, libraries, archives, historic houses around the world. So that's sort of where we're going with all these presentations. Um, and what I'm thinking is what we may do is rather than take questions after each talk, we'll see how we're doing on time, but rather assemble the three panelists and take uh, questions as a group. 
But let's see how we're doing. So our first paper is entitled Good Practices from the Past, the Application of Heritage Science to Museum Environments in the 1930s. So this is where we look back. And it will be presented by uh, Andrea Luciani. And he earned an MS in architecture in 2007 and a PhD in the preservation of architectural heritage at the Polytech uh, in Milano. And the Polytech Milano, I was online last night trying to learn about my uh, participants through LinkedIn and Facebook and every uh, search engine possible. And what I did find was a fantastic uh, YouTube video on his institution, which is celebrating their 100, 150th year anniversary. I urge you to take a look at that. Um, after an international internship in 2011 at the Center for Energy Efficiency and Historic Buildings in uh, Sweden, he's now a collaborator at the Laboratory for the Analysis and Diagnostic of uh, the Built Environment in the Milano Polytech. He's also adjunct faculty member in the Department of Architecture and Urban Studies, and he has many areas of interest and in research. If you go online, you'll be able to see his uh, summary of his dissertation, as well as many, many articles that he's published. But some of his areas of interest include, of course, the indoor climate and historic buildings. So, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, so, as you heard, my background is in uh, architecture and in um, <clears throat> conservation of uh, historic buildings. So. Uh, the point is, I want to start from is uh, how does climate control affect building conservation? So why an architect, as I am, is interested in indoor climate and in uh, air conditioning in uh, historic buildings? And the answer is sadly in this picture. So uh, obviously, I, I chose the worst possible case probably, but the the point is that, uh, as, as you can see. Uh, very often, historic buildings are are forced to to um, are pushed by conservation startups to achieve a level of climate control uh, which they have never meant for. So th this is where the the problem begin. Uh, but so that from this uh, started the uh, the first question of my presentation that it was if this is had always been like that and uh, also. Uh, seen the influence of or the spread of our conditioning I, I also asked to myself we, what, what uh, how did museum control uh, climate indoor climate or indoor climate before the spread of our conditioning so uh, today I will present uh, the period of the 30s because I I found this is a, a very interesting period because uh, museums uh, in this period started to, to face the, the, the problems uh, we, we systematically and, um, <clears throat> and also the, uh, the, there was, a, um, there was a, a strong international effort towards the, the codification of, of a conser conservative practice in, in museum and or of scientific practice. Uh, and also, we, we have the, the spread of, uh, uh, of modern air conditioning systems, the first example of, uh, of museums were with the air conditioning systems. Uh, and also, we have the codification of museography as a, as a science in, the, in this year. So uh, all, all these factors have a strong influence on, the, on how museums were conceived and how uh, they were built and how the indoor environments were controlled. Uh, and in this, in all these processes, um, and there is this institution that was the International Museum Office that had a, a strong influence and organized it to a very important conference on museums and on conservation. The first one was the one in Rome in 1930 on the um, on the methods for of non-scientific methods ap applied to the conservation and examination of pictures. And the second one is uh, museography. That is this conference which set the beginning of uh, museography as a, as, a, as a science, as a main <coughs> codified discipline. Um, so uh, the, the other point is that during the 30s, the, uh, as we have seen, the, the, the indoor climate management was uh, one of the most challenging fields uh, for, uh, for museum staff, for professionals, for scholars. Uh, and in these years, we can probably uh, began that process that resulted in the, what Mikalski has defined, the magic numbers for climate control in museums, so the international standards we have heard about also yesterday. Uh, so the, 
uh, a sign, a very um, clear sign of the interest of, uh, of science on conservation that arose in this period was the introduction of scientific laboratory museum. In the, the first one, uh, as we have seen uh, uh, yesterday also, was the, the laboratory in the State Museum of Berlin, where, so they are directed by uh, Ratgen. Then we have the British Museum Laboratory that uh, started uh, in, in the 20s, but then was uh, entered officially the institution in the 31. Uh, and we have the, another very important uh, laboratory was the research department of the Fogart Museum in, at Harvard University uh, that started his activities in uh, 1925. But then, in the, as you can see, I, I just put uh, some of the most important uh, uh, laboratories. You see, in the, in the 30s, all around uh, Europe and North America, there is a, a blooming of, uh, of a, a scientific laboratory and institution interested in, uh, in uh, scientific me methods in, uh, in conservation. Uh, and so we arrived to the conference in Rome that was, as I already told, uh, an important point. Uh, uh, an Italian art uh, historian and museum director, a very important one, who was Corrado Ricci who attended this conference in Rome, uh, and he claimed that this conference has the merit for moving the delicate question of preserving the artistic masterpiece from the realm of empiricism to the realm of science. So um, in this conference, for I think, I don't know if it was the first time, <laughs> it's always delicate to say it was the first one, but uh, for sure it was one of uh, a very important uh, event because uh, uh, scientists, museum conservators, museum directors, art historians were together and discussed the conservation and the restoration of pictures. Uh, here is a lot of words, but <laughs> I want to just, it, they are taken from the uh, final, um, the, the conclusions of the, of the conference. And wh what I underline is that uh, the, how the, um, the, influence, the, um, the influence of uh, agrothermal parameters were, was discussed and was, uh, uh, was uh, recognized as a main problem for, for museum in this period. And in particular, in the, at this age, we, uh, people, museum, uh, people are working in museum were uh, worried about the, the introduction of, uh, of humidity, of, uh, about the problem of humidification in museum because after the introduction of central heating system in the 19th century, uh, we, we, there were a lot of problems caused by this early system because they didn't have humidification, so they, they, it was just heating, so the relative humidity fell down, and they had a lot of problems with the mechanical damage in museums. A lot of problems were observed. So he, here is the, uh, a picture from a more or less a typical uh, humidification system in the, at this time that is are these uh, spraying, uh, water spraying system that were originally used in uh, air conditioning for cleaning the air and cleaning the air from dust, but then uh, they were also used to, for humidification. So, and uh, instead here you can see air filters and uh, heating batteries. These are taken from the, uh, from, uh, from the refurbishment of the uh, climate control system of the National Museum in Stockholm. Uh, but going back to going back to to science, to conservation science in the 30s, these are uh, in, quite very influential experiments that were carried out by the National Gallery of London, uh, and they were carried out because after the 1929 there was a a very dry winter, and so they had a, the National Gallery observed a lot of decay of mechanical decay in their in their collection. Uh, and so asked for, to the British Ministry of Wars and the Forest Products Laboratory, uh, asked for a for consultancy about the, the problems and if, if it was possible to, uh, to find solutions and to investigate about the influence of temperature and relative humidity variation on mechanical damage. So these are the samples that were used and were in climatic chamber to analyze it. And then there was this uh, other experiment that was uh, related with the measure of uh, equilibrium moisture content in, uh, in, moisture, in uh, wooden samples uh, exposed in the gallery. Uh, the, these, uh, these experiments were presented in a publication from the Cortal Institute of Art in 1934. Uh, and it's, it's curious that uh, 
the, the one that intro, re, uh, wrote the introductive article for this, uh, for this uh, book was uh, an engineer. Uh, it was John Andrew McIntyre, uh, which is, uh, I think he was a very influential uh, scholar in this period, but I, I think he is not very well known and he will deserve maybe more, more studies about this, uh, this man <laughs> because he, he wrote this introduction and he said, uh, as you can see here, uh, he said these, uh, uh, these um, specifications for as a, a specification that could be achievable uh, and w should be good for conservation in, a, in, a, in storage. Uh, and what I want you to, to notice is that the specification for, for temperature that is around 15.5 degrees uh, is it's the temperature at which he claims that galleries were kept at that time. So uh, when we talk about the human comfort zone, it has not always been like that. So as you can see in, uh, in, uh, in the 30s, it was normal to, for museums to have 15 degrees in their collection, in their, in their um, rooms, uh, and the, instead the relative humidity specification suggested is is a 60 percent, uh, but it's not suggested as an ideal one, but uh, as something that can be can be uh, achievable in a, in a in a storage. Uh, then we in a, we we have the Madrid conference in 1934. Uh, this was a very important conference uh, for the development of museum studies and. And as you can see here, the, it, it, it caused a change in the museum environment, both from an aesthetical point of view, but also uh, from the point of view of, of comfort and of, of uh, conservation of, uh, of paintings and on providing uh, good conditions for, for the artworks. Um, you can see here in this picture from the Louvre refurbishment. Uh, and again, the, the, in, there was a publication after the conference, of the proceedings of the conference, and there was a specific chapter on uh, heating and air conditioning and, uh, in museums, and again it was uh, written by John Andrew McIntyre. And again, uh, he said he gave some, uh, uh, some specifications for, our, for uh, relative humidity. And as you can see here, what I think is important is that these uh, specific specifications are not as much a specification about an ideal climate, but about what, what is uh, achievable in, uh, uh, in museums, and it's uh, uh, strongly related with the, uh, with the type of, uh, of uh, um, climate control system that, uh, that is installed in museums. So, uh, he said we, we must accept that if a museum has no uh, water spring system, so he, if he, the museum cannot provide humidification, uh, the, the, the humidity will range from 80% to 25%. And this, we have to, to keep in mind that these are the conditions to which paintings and artworks have been exposed for, for decades uh, before air condition. So, and even if we, with the uh, air spring system, the, the range was uh, between 50% uh, and 80%. Uh, this is a, a, an air conditioning system that uh, John Andrew McIntyre designed uh, in, uh, in the 34. Um, and uh, I think it's quite interesting because we can see how, uh, apart from his uh, words, how he tried to apply what he said. Uh, and in this case, he, he couldn't apply, uh, I mean, the problem here was also that uh, the um, refrigerate, refrigeration apparatus were very expensive and the technology was still not ready. So uh, they couldn't have refrigeration, they couldn't have dehumidification. Uh, so the, uh, in this case, the idea of McIntyre was to control the humidity uh, variation and the uh, high humidity levels by using buffer materials. Uh, and it, this it was quite surprising for me that he, the, he cho chose to use uh, old firehose canvas as a buffer material. So how he, did he do? Uh, as we can see in this uh, drawing by Tim Padfield, he stuffed the ducts of the air conditioning system with this uh, hose canvas. Uh, firehose canvas, so because it was uh, the cheapest material, uh, hygroscopic materials he could uh, find, uh, and uh, th this is how he he tried to 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 obtain uh, uh, good conditions. Uh, he claimed that uh, this uh, system could uh, 
limit the range of variation in uh, between uh, 55 and 75 percent. Uh, that is, I think, is quite good. It's not as far from the uh, recent specification as the ASHRAE specifications for, for museums. Uh, and the, the range recorded during the first year of operation was between 55 and 67 percent. And but we, I mean, we don't have evidence of this, but that are not the words from the, the, the same designer who, who did it. So it, I, I, we have to take, for, take them, but we are not so sure. Uh, the only evidence we have is this graph uh, that is, uh, uh, but it, it, it refers to the first week, to a week of tests before the, the paintings were introduced in the gallery. So the, still you can see that, uh, the condition with the, when the automatic control was on or were uh, enough stable. So we, we, uh, this, uh, this system was uh, really appreciated by, the, his, by people at the time. So uh, Collins Baker uh, said that they were the, the climate control was the most efficient in, the, in, the, in any other picture gallery. And, but we, we also see that he has been uh, appreciated also by uh, people from our days, and uh, as we have seen yesterday, I, I like to to think that these, uh, I mean, that uh, Tim Potfield and Paul Clance Larson that presented yesterday have had some inspiration by this uh, system and on the use of uh, uh, high, of, of buffer materials or hygroscopic materials to buffer the the humidity. So as we have seen yesterday, it could be a good solution. Uh, another uh, example is the Toledo Museum of Art, and uh, I chose it because in uh, this museum there was a, from 1911, uh, 1912 to 1932, there was a sequence of three different uh, strategies, um, uh, of three, three different uh, climate control systems. The first one was uh, a system with uh, couplet radiators that were uh, um, positioned in the middle of the rooms and so surrounded by seats. This was a, a common solution for museum in the end of 19th century. We can see here that the Alte Pinacothek in Munich, uh, it was quite common uh, as a system. So you can see these heating batteries in the middle of the rooms uh, surrounded by seats. But the museum was not satisfied uh, because they had problems with the visitors that feel not so comfort comfortable. Uh, with the artworks, and also they were not satisfied because they didn't want to have these seats in the, just in the middle of the room. So uh, the second idea was to move the radiators in, into the, the thickness of the wall, the, of the walls of the, of the museum. Uh, also, they added the humidification because they, uh, of course, had problem with the, 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 the air was too dry. Uh, so, and the idea was to, to put the, the radiators in the, into the thickness of the walls and to, to have air be, being introduced by, uh, from the, behind these, uh, these, kind, these radiators. Here we have something similar that was made in France and in Germany. Uh, so you can see here you have the, the batteries and here you have the air inlet. Uh, then in uh, Toledo Museum there was a, uh, the, um, the uh, extraction of the air was here, while here we can see uh, that uh, it was also, uh, the, in this case, where they tried to, to avoid the, the, um, the movements of air by hiding them under the wall so that we have a convective uh, flow uh, going like that. Um, but again, the, the, problem have the, the, the system had the problem to create uh, hot air flows uh, had the, with damaging drying effect on the pictures. Uh, and also other problems with overheating in summer and uh, um, and other problems. So th this was the final solution. And as you, as you can see, the final solution was uh, an air conditioning system, uh, when, when the the air was treated in the in the basement of the of the of the museum, and then was uh, we have these ducts uh, and the. Release of the of the air in the in the room was uh, from this uh, um, from this uh, uh, from this uh, sorry um, a very uh, very uh, small um, air vents here that 
we can see in a picture were practically uh, invisible. Uh, so, and then the air extraction was moved on the on the top of the of the galleries under the the skylight, so that uh, the ICAL could be controlled better controlled. Uh, so again, we have uh, the proud um, we have a, a sorry a proud the statement from the conservator that says that this was the best system in the ever created, but. Uh, what I think it was more interesting is that it clarifies the, the approach that we have in, in these years about museum, uh, climate control in museums. So uh, as the engineer uh, states in this declaration, the, uh, since the museum was, uh, was built in three phases, they, they have the, or the opportunity to, uh, to, see, to learn from their errors, to correct the, what was wrong, and they... Uh, so they learn from uh, from the the process. So I think that he, this allows me to make some points about the, how the this, the climate control was applied in, in the in this year. So uh, if relative uni unity for sure was uh, recognized as the main factor in influence, influencing artworks conservation. So it was the it was clear in this year that it, it, this was the parameter to be controlled. Uh, then we have uh, we, we have seen uh, has, how experimental research and uh, and then empiric knowledge w was matched to 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 find to obtain some result. We we have seen the increasing su success of air conditioning system and also, but what I think it's more important we have seen in this this uh, approach it, it's a kind of a, a adaptive strategy applied to conservation environments. So try to understand what what is best to do in that moment in that place for for the museum, and also we, we see this uh, learning from errors approach, so always try to, to do best to improve the, the system. Uh, then after the, the 30s, we have the, um, I think we have a, a sort of, of, of shift, a, I, I call it a change of paradigm, so uh, that was uh, characterized by the, the, the experience of the wartime repository of the, of the British museums in, uh, during the Second World War because I think this was one of probably the most successful application of this approach, but at the same time, uh, this caused the, a change in the approach because uh, these, uh, these um, shelters were, were uh, recovered, the artworks were recovered in uh, underground caves, so they had to, the atmosphere had to be controlled, so they built these kind of shelters where the, in which the indoor environment was very strictly controlled by an air conditioning system. Uh, and these, uh, these uh, paintings uh, were preserved so well that this was, a, 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 I think, a f mm, was the, the main uh, evidence that led to the spread, definitive spread of full air conditioning system in, uh, in museums. So we have positive drawbacks, uh, positive consequences that are the, okay, <laughs> I conclude, uh, that are the, 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 uh, the importance of preventive conservation that has been understood in this time and also not so positive uh, uh, drawbacks that are the, the fact that from this point on the museum conservator engineers think that everything is possible to, I mean, uh, every kind of climate is achievable inside museums and so we can do uh, whatever we want and we will have a perfect indoor climate in museums because there is air conditioning and one of the consequences uh, I mean, this uh, museum that we have here in, in Paris, where the, 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 the building, the uh, building services and the heating the systems uh, have become the, the building, and inside you, you have the, more, the most complete freedom to, to do whatever you want. Uh, then let me spend just a few words about historic buildings uh, to conclude. <laughs> uh, the, uh, as I, we saw, that this approach, if applied to new museum, can be okay. Uh, but if we apply this approach to historic buildings, we, we have a lot of problems. And uh, what, what I want to say to conclude is, even um, uh, recent standards uh, go, are going in the direction of, of trying to understand the condition that we have in, uh, in buildings before making any intervention. So have a... Uh, in-depth analysis, analysis of the condition and also uh, try to understand what, what, what are the performance of, of these uh, buildings. And uh, here I, I just put two graphs uh, where we can see, that, where we can see the, 
the performance of two unheated rooms in, a, in two historic buildings, one in Italy and the other one in, in Sweden. And, and also they are compared with the uh, target range defined by the recently approved uh, European standards, uh, 15757. And as you can see, uh, probably if we follow these standards, there is not so much to do. They can be, these environments can be okay without the need of installing air conditioning. So thank you for, for your attention, and you can find uh, uh, some other articles on this. Thank you.